Hello once again, everybody. Welcome to Soccer's Overtime, your weekly look inside the San Diego Soccer's and the Major Arena Soccer League. Coming to you live on Twitch.tv, our San Diego Soccer's Twitch channel. Craig Elston, Jerry Jimenez, back with you, reunited once again. It's a Tuesday. It's 5 o'clock Pacific time. That means it's Soccer's Overtime. Episode 19 of Season 4 is bring you this evening we're calling it feasting the east as the soccers go east and win two games in less than 24 hours to run their winning streak to 15 in a row jerry jimenez so great to see you as always my friend good to see you sir i love the title of this one beasting the east because that, that's absolutely what we did what an amazing uh weekend we thought it was going to be hard we knew it was going to be hard i should say uh, and and it was, and we'll get into those games. I'm excited to talk about these because these were two very exciting, very fun games. But what else have you come to expect from the San Diego Soccer's, right? Wins, success, occasionally <laughs> close games. Occasionally. <laughs> you know, and this week, you know, one game that was very close, one game that was competitive throughout to be sure, but two solid victories for San Diego. Want to say a special hello to our early adopters, those folks who have jumped in watching us live here on Twitch that are joining us in the comments thread. Welcome to each one of you. We'll be mixing in uh, live viewer comments, both to the video screen and to our audio patter as we continue. We also want to say hi to everyone who's watching the replay, watching us on our YouTube channel. If you are and you like what you're seeing, please do us a favor, like this video, hit that subscribe button. It definitely does a lot of help for us and a final hello to everyone just listening on in our audio listeners our podcast friends welcome this show is for you everything else it's just the bells and whistles you know coming up on today's show it is moving week jerry the biggest week of masl matches this season that don't involve the san diego soccer's has arrived. We will break that all down. We've got a special guest and making his debut on Soccer's Overtime, MASL primetime host Alex Bastiavansky is going to join us. He's going to help us preview the league playoffs, talk about postseason awards, talk about some of the new weekly content the league is putting out. And we've got an important update to the MASL playoff format, one that absolutely could and quite possibly will impact the San Diego Soccers. That's all coming up. But Jerry, let's get things started talking about what we saw on the East Coast. The San Diego Soccers, uh, one of two East Coast road trips that they're making in the course of three weeks, a Friday flight out to Baltimore, Maryland, a Saturday night game at Towson University, Siku Arena against the Blast, the highlights of which we're starting to roll in here on our live Twitch broadcast. And then, of course, a Sunday morning affair uh, in Utica. More on that uh, in a little bit. But Jerry Soccer's beat Baltimore 9-6. to six. And you got to start, I think, by talking about the start. Soccers get out to a 3-1 jump over Baltimore on their home floor. And it got me to look it up. And I went to the MASL Daily Stat Pack this morning, Jerry. And the Soccers have scored 25 away goals in the first quarter this year. That's the most in the MASL by eight over any other team. And in both games this weekend, three goals in the first quarter, helping get things going. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it shows, you know, it, it goes to show that the soccers are, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just, I like first quarters. So let's just put it that way. First and foremost, uh, for the soccers, that's fantastic. That's such a great stat by eight leads MASL by eight and the, the quick starts. That's, that's amazing. Now they need to keep that going throughout the game and this one didn't quite happen. I think we've seen it a lot this year where they go off to a very quick start, put in a few in the back and then kind of take the foot off the pedal a little bit, let the other team catch up a tiny bit. And then maybe we go back into it and, and, you know, do what we got to do and handle business. But what a, what a great stat. That's very interesting to see. Yeah. I think it's a big, I mean, the soccer's are 10 and 0 on the road and you say, well, why are the soccer's 10 and 0 on the road? 
Soccer's have 25 away goals in the first quarter. That's an average of two and a half away goals per match, which tells mm-hmm. you you're getting off to good starts. You, you're generally setting the tone on the road. You're allowing your team's confidence to flow. And more important than that, you are taking the opposing crowd out of the match. You're taking the opposing crowd away. You're taking the original game plan of the home team away. And you're saying, okay, what are you going to do now? Yeah, uh, You're trailing. So really great sign. Uh, and as we're seeing right now, that third goal, which ended the first quarter, it happened with like three seconds left in the quarter. Sarah to squaring a ball across the yellow line to Mitchell Cardenas, who blasts it in kind of a low dipping shot that curved between the Baltimore defense and William Van Zella. I thought that too was a huge tone setter in the match. Just a little bit of a, an early heartbreak for the home team. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then I'm just looking at the uh, the video here. Um, if you're listening, I'm sorry. This is why you need to join us on Tuesdays. Okay, this is how we bribe you into watching Tuesdays at five. Uh, but Gonzalez is not happy there, and just you know, letting letting the uh, Baltimore player know. I'm not exactly sure who he was yelling at. Luckily, he was yelling at a couple of people. Um, yeah, I think it was uh, Diesel. Yeah, it was Diesel early on. But yeah, it was. They were they were getting into it. And these two teams, you know, even though they rarely play, they. They both teams know the legacy, you know, that they bring mm-hmm. onto the floor and the rivalry, but you know, that's historic between these two clubs. And you always see, you know, an, an elevated level of competition. I think you saw that again on Saturday night. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it, it's it's one of those things when when teams like this with such a legacy meet each other, it's always going to be a fun time. It's always going to be something that people look forward to. I mean, we saw it against Wave. We saw it against uh, Kansas City as well. You know, these games mean something to the fans and the players know it. And it means something to the players as well. It means to the it means something to the entire organization uh, when you go into games like this one. And so I was really looking forward to see this game. Uh, you know, was not disappointed. Obviously, it was very chippy at points. But it, it mean, one thing that, you know, as a new uh, fan coming into the league, I mean, I had joked, I had heard it joked about and I had I saw I had seen games from Baltimore. I had seen games from Baltimore, but maybe hadn't paid as close attention as I should have because immediately I'm like, wow, that is a small field. That is a tiny field. It's the smallest field. It's a huge advantage for the blast. Uh, It's definitely one of the things that, you know, every team has to deal with when they get into Baltimore. But I thought it, Game flow is where I thought things really changed. And, you know, uh, Brad Crossley in, in the chat saying things got chippy. They did. But, you know, you look to that second quarter, Jerry, and, and the second quarter was a one nothing quarter. It was the first. It was, in fact, the only quarter of the entire trip the soccer's didn't score uh, until the fourth quarter of uh, Utica when everyone was completely exhausted and they were just hanging on. Uh, soccer's had scored in 12 straight quarters before that second. But what, what also happened in that second quarter was four yellow cards were issued. MASL Director of Officiating Ryan Sigich was there, but his second official on the floor was Shane Butler. And Shane Butler showed the cards, as we've seen Shane Butler show the cards. He's, he's a guy who likes to That's use nice. that card to get control. And I did think that Sandy, that the soccer's, and we've seen it a couple of times before, Jerry, this year, started to think a little a bit about the officiating in the second and third quarters, started to look at the officials during plays as opposed to just focusing on the action. And whenever they do that, that's playing into the opponent's hands. I give Baltimore credit as a veteran team. They took that chippiness level up. They said, okay, we're not beating the soccers with pure skill. Our field isn't intimidating them. What can we do? Let's get this game a little physical. Let's get this game a little hot under the collar. And the result you know, as the soccer's are chirping, Baltimore scores four straight goals, turns three one up to five three down. I mean, much credit to the blast. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, that was getting scary there for a bit because they did pick it up. You started seeing these numbers go up, and you're thinking now, okay, it's four three. What happened to that three one lead? And then it's five three. You know, luckily, as we're seeing here on the screen as well, the the, the soccer's were able to bring that back up and and and, and bring it up to 5-5 five, five, uh, with, uh, you know, about 30 seconds left in the third quarter. But, I mean, it took a little while for the soccer to figure out, okay, this is what 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 are we doing here? Let's let's pick it back up. Uh, to the credit of Baltimore, I mean, they did what they had to do, and it worked for a little while. It definitely worked. But the go-ahead goal scored by Craig Childs with 24 seconds left in the third quarter and 
more than just the goal, which is a lovely, you know, first time, you know, pivoting his body as the ball comes in to, to take the shot first time. It is a huge howling celebration in front of Adriano Dos Santos, one of the veterans of the Baltimore Blast, a big fish pup. He made a point of not looking at Adriano in the eye, so he didn't get a yellow card uh, for taunting. But I that was a <laughs> statement. I mean, it you know, look, some people, you're not going to like it, especially if you're on the other team and a guy's making the big woo, you know, in front of you. But obviously, you know, there was some stuff that was being said down on the floor and Craig made a pretty emphatic statement there with the goal and with his celebration. Oh, absolutely. Mr. Uh, Magic Mustache, Craig Childs. That was that was a beautiful goal. And then we see the seventh put in, uh, being put in the back of the net by uh, Christian Gutierrez, uh, who picked it up this weekend as well, man. Yes. It was great to see uh Gutierrez uh get a couple in the back of the net and really that shot I mean beautifully placed uh who was the uh, oh and that assist that, that well, yeah it's the assist man the ooh, no yeah, look the behind assist. the back assist uh, who, by Leo who else but Leo Leo de Oliveira with that oh my gosh what a beautiful if you didn't see that seventh goal go back and watch it beautiful pass behind the uh the back uh, no no look pass and then Gutierrez takes advantage of it, puts it on the top left corner. Beautiful. But then Baltimore comes back, you know, and, and puts the sixth one in the back behind Pardo. They do, and it's it's right there. It's another close match. Pardo makes some big saves down the stretch. Charlie Gonzalez, Brandon Escoto team up uh, on what turns out to be the, the clinching goal that makes it 8-6. to six. Uh, Juan Manuel Rojo and Pino get loose uh, to get you to 8-9-6. to nine, six which is the final score in, in that one. But, you know, I, I just, I keep thinking about the Leo pass. Yeah. Leo gets the, the setup on, I believe it was five, four as well, how he controls the match at critical moments. You know, the, the, there's certain players who take command when it's needed. And Leonardo de Oliveira is tops on the list for me on the San Diego soccer's when it comes to that. And the reason for that, Jerry is Escoto somewhat uh, is like this as well, but he's a player that can do it with the ball on his toe. You know, Leo can create a shot for himself. He can create shots for his teammates. He's the best on the whole team at winning the ball back in the midfield. He can dribble out of a triple team and, 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 you know, fire that ball out and keep the offense moving. And I feel like, a moment like that, a play like that, it's just one thing, but it's one of those things that puts Leo in the MVP conversation for me. The the way he handles huge moments with spectacular, you know, feats of skill that most players would be deathly afraid to attempt in a game. A no look behind the back back heel pass, you know, in the offensive zone. If that goes the wrong way and it's a counter and it's a two VO the other direction, right? You know, yeah. you're never you're never going to see the floor again. But Leo yeah. has that confidence. He has that ability to execute a huge play at a huge moment. And I think that's why, you know, and we'll talk more about kind of MVP ranking uh, as we continue. But that's why I feel like he's rising in the ranking. Oh, 100 percent. And I mean, Leo is just it, he's such an amazing player with the ball at his feet. I, I will never get tired of watching him play. It is it's just amazing to watch him do his thing throughout the entire match. And the way that he controls it, as you mentioned, is just beautiful. I do want to give also a, a shout out on that eight goal um, to Charlie Gonzalez, who uh, I believe the assist was from Tavoy Morgan mm -hmm. on that eighth goal. Uh, Charlie just, again, I think I've said it multiple times on the show, he finds space where there is none. He'll, he'll make it. You know, he will make himself uh, have room to take a shot and then just put the ball in the back of the net. And also an important situation like that one where uh, it's seven, six, and then the eighth comes in and starts feeling, okay, a little bit better there in the fourth. Uh, and, and then we, we take it out. We take it home with, with Rojo uh, on that last one and, and Pino on the assist, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, yeah. just a beautiful, beautifully played game. I think, um, I think the soccer's came in with, with a, uh, you know, with the game plan. They knew they had to play a, a game the next one, and so they did take the pedal, uh, the foot off the pedal a little bit in the in the second, not so much, but in the third, quite a bit, and then picked it back up in the fourth. Uh, man, what a, what a game! It was a game that mattered. You know, it's a game that mattered to both teams as well. 
you know, I, I, I noted it during research uh, for the week, researching our press notes that, you know, there's Baltimore sitting in the fourth position and they're still in the fourth position. Uh, one point right now ahead of Chihuahua for fourth position for top wild card. But the blast are now 10 and eight. They went 0 and 2 this weekend. They are 10 and three against teams ranked ninth, 10th, 11th, or 12th in the MASL bracket. In other words, non-playoff teams. That's where Baltimore has all of their wins and three losses. But against teams in the top eight, they are 0-5. And it's not that they've been blown out. You know, they played Florida very close. They played the Soccers close, competitive. You know, Milwaukee was a a game they lost, close, competitive. But 0-5, you know, I mean, mean, that's that's not nothing. And... (laughs) It, it, if they don't get that turned around, Baltimore becomes kind of a team you want to face in the playoffs. And it sounds weird being on that baby field, but that's the last point before we switch games, Jerry. Soccer's have now, they're the small field superstars of the MASL so far this year. I mean, down to Chihuahua, 2-0, and go to Baltimore, get a win, 3-0 and on baby, baby fields, on Cancha Pequeña. You know, and it's, that's big news. Oh, I love that. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I totally agree on that. It's so, it's, it's good, it's good to see, but it's also like, man, can we do something about those field sizes? I mean, I don't know if we can, but it, I, I feel like it's talked about enough. We'll, um, send, start sending letters. Just let them know, hey, small fields. Uh, I don't, I don't want to give Brad heart heartburn talking about okay. the fields. I'm sure he'd rather be at Royal Farms Arena. I'm sure most Baltimore <laughs> Blast fans would be rather be on a real field. Uh, you know. It is what it is. I mean, I don't like it any more than you do. When I was there, like you get heart palpitations watching those games because there's <laughs> yeah, just yeah. there's never a break. Your offense, 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 defense, 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 offense. It's it's crazy, uh, and of course Chihuahua is exactly the same way. Uh, they're slightly yeah. larger, slightly less wide. It's two versions of the same thing. So yeah. three and zero. Oh, you know, uh, small field superstars. Boris Pardo has won all three of those games. And and I think that's important to note as well, because your stats always take a beating when you go to a small field, it's kind of like a pitcher going to Coors field in the NL West, you know, where if you, if you give up five runs in six innings, that's a pretty darn good start. Whereas if you're at Petco park, that's a terrible start, you know, yeah. uh, that, that's what it's like in, in indoor as well. So, I mean, you look at the games and I believe Boris has allowed five, six and 10 goals so that you know, 21 goals and that, that's almost like half the goals he's allowed this year are in those yeah. three games but you count the yeah. three and oh you count the three and oh and almost no one else can do that you know that, that's why Berna Valdivinos is racking up the wins he knows how to play that small field oh yeah yeah no it it goes to show you know what a great goalkeeper Pardo is I think he's done a fantastic job and and you know, talking about goalkeepers, I really do want to give a quick shout out to William Vanzilla, who is an amazing goalkeeper. I love Absolutely. him as not just a professional soccer player and goalkeeper, but as a human being, he is hilarious. He's probably one of the coolest people you will ever get to meet. If you ever get a chance to meet him, please do so. Uh, you will not be disappointed. He is such a character. He's such a good person. Um, it almost hurt, man, watching us score on him so much. Like, but at the same time, it did it. But you know what I mean? Like, it's <laughs> enjoyed it, but I <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm good with it. I'm yeah, yeah. With it. I love, much love to William, though. As I say every time, much love to soccer for life, William Van Zell. That's right. That's right. Former soccer's goalkeeper. William and Van champion Zell. with the soccer's. Exactly. So, uh, that was one of two matches, of course, on the weekend, Jerry. And, uh, you know, we've only got a few minutes before we get to our special guest here. So, uh, soccer's beat Utica city FC six to five on Sunday. And the real story is what happened in between matches. If we're being honest, the, the real story is soccer's get out of Baltimore between nine 30 and 10 o'clock on Saturday night and having to stop at least one time for fuel and food, the soccer's wind up spending almost eight hours in a bus going from 
you know, Baltimore, Maryland to upstate New York, Utica, New York. They get into the hotel at Utica uh, a little bit before sunrise, knowing that they have to get back on the bus to get to the arena at a quarter to 12 uh, for a 2 p.m. kickoff against Utica City FC. Keep in mind that this was Saturday night, the 12th, going into Sunday morning, the 13th, which meant the 2 a.m. hour didn't exist. Two became three because it was daylight savings time. Think hour off the board. And of all of the nights to take an hour off the board, it was that night. So your San Diego soccer, as you see the highlights against Utica, basically didn't sleep going from the Baltimore match to the Utica match. They got whatever sleep they could get in a van driving on the highway or settling into a room for a couple of hours. And I mean, literally a couple of hours uh, in, in Utica before they had to suit up and go to the game. Paul Savage racing from room to room, trying to get guys loose, trying to get guys legs, right. Trying to, trying to get a, at least a little bit of recovery and what you, you saw is San Diego got out a win, Jerry. And for example, we're seeing the highlight right now of Craig Childs scoring his only goal of the match, pretty much his only time on the floor because he had a bad hamstring from the night before and he didn't have any time to really get good treatment. So he took a leg swing there, tweaked mm -hmm. his hammy, and that was it. You know, Childs was the rest of the game. Felipe Gonzalez, uh, late second quarter, tweaked his knee, had to come out. That was it. Felipe missed the rest of the game. Guerrero Pino in the fourth quarter banged into Xavier Snare Williams. He had to leave the game and, and didn't return. So, you know, the soccer's were banged up and you really were watching. And by the second half, you could see it, I think, Jerry. Christian Gutierrez had his legs. Juan Manuel Rojo had his legs. Tavoy Morgan, to some extent, had a little bit of his legs. And that was kind of it. Everyone else was was struggling out there. They 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 were tired. They were burned. And it just made me re remember one more time. Thank God for the TJ counter. Thank God for Rojo and Gutierrez yeah. and their ability to get up the floor and to be fitter than most of the players in the MASL because that's how this game is won, is on the TJ counter. It's Rojo and it's Gutierrez. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was tough to see these guys were were definitely struggling. I mean, you could tell. Um, and and yeah, <laughs> thank God for the TJ Counter uh team. But uh I think you called them in the notes here. The rest of them were the the dead leg gangs, dead legs gang. Yeah. At this point. I mean, they really were. It it was <laughs> tough. It was hard to watch. You knew how exhausted they were, you knew what they were up against. And by the way, Utica had to win. Like, if they got three points out of this match, it could be the match that gets them into the playoff conversation and maybe a chance to sneak into that eight spot and to force the Sockers to go cross-country again, you know, yeah. uh, in, in the first week of, of April. So I, I thought, like, sneakily, this was one of the most impressive wins of the year because it's the third different time in this year that there's a game on the schedule that we looked at and we wrote an L next to it because we said, this is a schedule loss. This is a loss where the MASL has written the loss into the books because they forced one team into such a difficult travel situation. And while the other team sleeps at home in their own bed and just goes, Oh, chill, all good. You know? And, and I think about this match. I think about that Tuesday night up in Ontario, Jerry, after the soccer's were in Chihuahua, Saturday and Sunday, and then traveled back on Monday and had to go right to Ontario uh, on Tuesday. That was a game where it was like, well, we're definitely going to lose this game. You know, uh, and this was another one. Well, this is a game that you're supposed to lose. And to find a way, even though 6 5 is the final score, to find a way to get three points in a regulation win out of this game, I thought it was one of the more impressive achievements of an impressive season. No, I have to agree with you on that one. I think that Utica did not care at all, and they wanted to take advantage of this uh, situation as much as possible because they did have to win. Um, and, you know, kudos to also the Utica fans, man. They're, what a great crowd they have uh, there in Utica City. I mean, this is probably one of the best crowds that I, I've seen, um, you know, for, for MASL. And, and it's they brought the, the you know, the 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 – Man, I can't even think today. I don't know what it is. It feels like a Monday, but it's Tuesday. Uh, with this hour change, but <laughs> the, 
brought the, they brought the volume they brought you know the uh excitement to the game and i mean i'm sure that the utica team was feeling them as well so kudos to them at the end of the day we we're able to hang on which is you know for us as, as soccer supporters this is soccer's overtime so you know it's a good thing for us but what a what a crazy thing to have to survive and um i mean you know champions don't sleep craig i don't know if you've heard this before but they don't they don't need no sleep man i'm pretty sure they like uh i mean there's Calafino tequila access a little, you know, easy there. <laughs> know. Uh, there might be, you know, a spare in the bus. I don't know if there's a spare. Yeah, there, there but the injuries, the bus. Yeah, but the injuries right? are the ones that worried me the most, man, with with uh, Charles, with uh, Felipe Gonzalez, and with uh, Guerrero Pino getting hurt on this one. I mean, you know, playing back-to-back -back like that, it, it was bound to happen. Somebody was going to get hurt. Um, I hope they're doing okay. But, you know, that would, for me, that was the worrying part. Not so much. Yeah, I wasn't so worried about the win. It was, uh, you know, can somebody get hurt because of such a quick turnaround and, and no rest? Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it seems like it wasn't so bad, but uh, hanging on at the end, man, that was that was huge. Yeah, they, you know, team hangs on. Obviously, there was a situation in net, uh, which I thought was, a, you know, slightly questionable. In terms of you decided to start Pardo for the the second game of the back to back, okay, you, you didn't start Xavier. Uh, you know we've we've seen that in the past. We saw that in Seattle, for example, or in Tacoma, I should say, where Boris started, but then I believe early in the third quarter turned it over to Xavier. And so I thought, okay, that's what they're going to do, right? They're going to they're going to build out a little bit of a lead against Utica. They're going to turn the, the match over to Xavier. That'll be it for Boris. And instead, one quarter, three to one. They make the switch, they go to Xavier, uh, and probably with the hope that the Sockers were just going to, you know, turn three to one into eight to one, and then it wasn't going to be an issue. But it was the dead legs game. They didn't, they didn't have that finishing kick. And when there was an unfortunate goal in the fourth quarter where Xavier was trying to clear it and it went off the chest of the defender for Utica and it banged into his own goal, and he and Pino chased after it and they ran into each other. Uh, Coach made the switch, you know, and, and switched back to Boris. And so then all of a sudden it was like, well, hang on. Now Boris is cold, 37-year-old, playing back-to-back, -back, but also he's cooled off, you know. And I thought big kudos to Boris for coming in and handling the last six minutes, you know, very professionally and, and, and closing out the win Trevor Hoffman style, you know, getting us that save. <laughs> <laughs> Xavier wound up getting the win because of game flow, but, uh, you know, give, give Boris the save. Uh, on that one again sneaky huge moment yeah i heard hell's bells playing in the background when he walked in that was great <laughs> that was awesome. yeah that fourth goal for utica man that was uh that was painful to see uh our boy uh you know snare williams go down like that too and, and a big mistake there uh from him but you know i'm sure i'm sure he learned from that one it looks like he got a, a bit of a knock on that one as well and uh, oh, that's when uh, I believe that's also when Pino got hurt, correct? That, that is correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah so P Pino wound uh, his head into the back of the net. Uh, and that, that was rough. And just to, to really quick, because I saw people say, well, what's the status? So the Sockers will play Sunday against Tacoma. More on that match later. But it is possible that Charles, Felipe Gonzalez, and Pino all miss the match. Um, but also, it's unlikely that any of those three miss significant time. I'll know a little bit more back at training tomorrow, Jerry. I think of the three, the one that you need to be worried about is Felipe, just because we've seen him with knee issues in the past. So you hope that there's not something that when the swelling went down, you discover something uh, in there. But from what I've been told, it, we, we've dodged big bullets in terms of you know major season-altering injuries. And quite frankly... You know, someone was going to get hurt on, yeah. on this road trip. It, it was inevitable. And, and you know, as we get, we transition out of this segment and move into our guest segment, I'll just say my two cents on a soapbox for 30 seconds. I know how hard it is to fit the schedules in this league. It's extremely hard because teams don't get number one arena availability very often in our league. And so you wind up with these awkward situations where I can only get my arena on Sunday. I can only get my arena on a Monday, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so you wind up with these tough spots, but two games, 19 hours between kickoffs and six hours as the crow flies between sites. That's not okay. That's not okay. It, 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 it leads to really 
poor soccer. And the fans who paid money in Utica to see the champs play saw a deeply, deeply reduced version of the San Diego soccers. And maybe if they were just looking for a win, they were happy. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, good. G give me the worst version of the soccers. But we don't want that in general in our league. We want to see the best of these teams, not a worst version of these teams. And so I really do hope that the league tries to avoid. It's, it, avoiding back-to-backs can be impossible. But avoiding the 19 hours travel in between type situations, those schedule losses, because you can pull something like that in the NBA when everyone's got a chartered jet to a four star hotel, you know, but but when it's a van to a Holiday Inn, it's not the same, you know, it's it's unglamorous, but it's also quite frankly dangerous and. and the fact that the soccer's wound up took, taking the, the Pino injury was a contact injury, but the, the fact that they took a couple of non-contact injuries in this, in the game, I feel is a direct reflection on the schedule. You know, it's nice to be able to say that even the worst San Diego team is still pretty darn good. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, it's the bottom of the hour, Jerry. Let's welcome in our special guest. And I'm so excited for this because, uh, you know, he's asked me to be his special guest several times. He is the host of MASL Primetime, which you see Wednesdays on the uh, league's MASL TV channel on YouTube. He is the master of the highlights of indoor soccer. We welcome for the first time ever onto Soccer's Overtime, Alex Bastjavansky joining us from north of the border. Alex, Craig, and Jerry here with you down in San Diego. Thank you so much for some time today. Guys, absolutely love what you do. And and it's about time that you started cashing in favors. The, the amount of times I've asked you to come on, <laughs> you to pick your brain, Craig. And, and, you know, it's all I can say is, you know, you've done such awesome stuff for me over the last couple of years when we've been on, so... It's a pleasure to be on the show. And Jerry, we've never actually been formally introduced, but nice to virtually meet you anyway as well. So great to Same. be on, guys. Same, sir. I'm a, I'm a very, very big fan. And um, yeah, I just, I, I love MASL primetime when I don't have enough time to catch up on uh, the other games. I'm watching it. So if you guys haven't checked it out, those that are listening in, you have to go and check it out on YouTube, MASL primetime. It's so good. I am so jealous of the studio. It is amazing, <laughs> uh, and we'll talk more about that. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll sure talk thing. more because I thank I you, it. appreciate it, Jerry. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually and just it right behind that bar is your studio, right? You go, you go uh, just past that bar behind you, and that's where exactly. the studio is. Just in the uh, back room is the studio. Let's call it that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, I make do with a small space. Let's put it that way. So, <laughs> but uh, thank you. And the master of the highlights part is kind of funny because. Um, every week when I'm cutting the show, I mean, we've got, what we don't even have 24 minutes anymore. We've got 22 minutes now. Um, because segment three is, it was cut for commercial time, commercial time because we're on, uh, root sports, of course, in the Pacific Northwest. So, um, uh, that segment is only four minutes now. Uh, the, as the last time Craig, I was talking to you about that, how it's like, it just flies by. Trying to cut the highlights for nine or 10 games is uh, on a weekly basis is challenging. It is challenging because you're trying to tell a story and you've got three segments to do it totaling 18 minutes on top of, you know, your hellos and your studio part and everything. And uh, you just hope that you can tell the, the proper, you know, the story of what actually happened in the game in a proper way. That's the big challenge, you know. And man, you guys had some storylines from last weekend. Let me just, and and that will be on the show when it comes out tomorrow. Um, and I led with the uh, I led with the Baltimore. I'm spoiling everything here, but I led with the Baltimore game. And my my main thing was it's been two years uh, since the two, I mean, most successful organizations in the MASL combined. And you guys can call me on this one. I believe it's 25 titles. You guys yep, have won. That is correct. Baltimore has won ten, and uh, and I was, I was so pumped for it. So I I built it up on the show, and I pointed out, and it wasn't the very last time you guys faced off because I think it was a week later or two weeks later you guys had a second game. But the game in Baltimore that they won nine five, 
was, uh, as they say on the show, heated to say the least. It, there were several blue cards. There was almost a full out brawl at one point. Um, two teams that I think have a lot of respect for one another, two organizations. But when they're on that floor, man, it is the gloves are off. Uh, there's a lot of pride on the line. And we saw that this weekend. I heard what you guys were talking about Baltimore, obviously. But they were up for that game, man. They were up for that game. And and it was dicey for a while. Like, that would have been huge if they would have pulled that off because you guys are obviously dominant this season. And they haven't quite lived up to their usual level of excellence. They've had a lot of stuff that's happened this year. But um, it was – what a great game. What a great game. What a great weekend you guys had overall. Challenging. It was a fun weekend. It was a good weekend for the league overall, but I think this coming week is going to be uh, one of the showcase weeks. We'll talk about it as we continue on. But I'm I'm just curious, Alex, like your indoctrination in, into the indoor soccer world, because you've had a couple seasons now. And of course, last year, the, the weird COVID season that we all sort of watched on our computers, so to speak. But, you know, I, I, obviously everyone can hear the, the, the Canadian uh, in your in your accent and, and in your well, little... I want to know because I don't know that I'm doing it. I, I hear I hear, a little, I hear a little Californian in yours, but what are the Canadian words that really pop? Am I saying a boot to you? Yes. Oh, it's just the, it's the you. It's the you. Yeah, it's the about. Yeah. about, about okay. About. Yeah. yeah. Which you know, which by the way, when I spent three years in hockey, I started to to say about, and I still do. I say boat about, and people go, "Are you Canadian?" I go, "No, I just I was around hockey too long." Well, when you've been dealing with the San Diego Gulls, you've had a lot of Canadians playing for your team, so you've heard it. Definitely. There's, there's yeah. no question. So uh, what I was what I was leading to is just kind of what's been your impression? Uh, you're in, you're getting accustomed to the culture of the MASL and indoor soccer and to the world of this wacky league. What what has it been like for you in terms of a a learning curve and and just kind of getting indoctrinated, so to speak? Well, love it. I mean, I've always been a soccer guy in general. Uh, I, I may have mentioned it before, Craig, but like, I mean, I've always, I, I grew up in the game. My father played uh, in the, the North American Soccer League um, back in the early 70s uh, for the Toronto Metros back then. Um, I grew up playing the game, uh, the outdoor game. And, uh, and I remember he took me to my first arena game in, well, actually, I'm going to date myself if I say when it was. Let's let's call it the er, the very early '80s, boys. Um, and I was absolutely hooked on it. And I, I, it was at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, and I was hooked on the arena game after that. Um, but then Toronto lost a team, and I don't think they even got one back until um, G, uh, the, the Thunderhawks in like the late '90s or something. I, I believe played one season. Um, so it was always the outdoor game. I followed the, the indoor game a bit. Um, always kept track of a little bit of things that were going on and stuff, but we didn't have it. I grew up in Toronto, so we didn't have it around our region or anything like that. Um, and then in, uh, in 2000 and what are we going here? 17, I guess, um, with the knowledge that Mississauga was going to get a team in the MASL. Um, there was a local league that was launched in Toronto to help prepare players to possibly play for the team the year before. So that was a really good move. Um, to get those players who'd only played outdoor soccer. So I spent the year covering that league, filming it, doing a show for that league, which really got me back into the indoor game again and up to speed on things. And then when the Metro Stars came out, I was the play-by-play -play guy for that year. With I, 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 You guys might know Stephen Caldwell, who was a former Scottish international, played for, the, uh, for TFC and is an analyst on TSN. So he was my, um, he was my color guy which was hilarious because he, so he hadn't done any indoor stuff as well. Um, and I hadn't, I hadn't called indoor soccer before. So the th two of us have been thrown in there. Now, Steven knows the game inside, out, you know, soccer inside out. He's a former Scottish international, right? Um, but we had a blast that first year, even though the Metro stars didn't do quite, you know, at, at the end of the second year, I think those guys would have had a pretty good year. They were learning the yeah. game on the go as well. Right. Uh, but yeah, and then and then after that, I you know I pitched to the league an idea about doing a doing a weekly show, and it was picked up in 2019-20 for the MASL. And Craig, you were of course one of the first guys who, who I called on, and I was like, I'm gonna you know probably every two or three weeks, man, I'm gonna have you on the show, and you're gonna help me get up to speed a lot quicker on the stuff that's going on. And who better to have as well? I mean, 
from the San Diego Soccer's, the, you know, the winningest team in, in indoor soccer history, right? So um, anyway, that's a slightly long-winded version of it. But yeah, it has been a blast. And I tell people who have never watched the indoor game all the time, I'm like, or if and who are maybe casual soccer fans or, or, or have never really cared too much for the outdoor game even, and I'm like, you've got to watch this because you will be hooked. It is, it's, it's just incredible. It's a combination of soccer and for, you know, all the folks north of the border, hockey as well. It's a winning combination, you know, and you've even got, the, even got the body checks and the fights in there sometimes too, as well. So, well, I got to uh, ask a follow-up. Uh, I got to ask a follow-up of you there, yeah. Alex, because um, it, actually it's on, it's on two levels. Cause first of all, that, that year with Mississauga uh, meant you got some time with Dwayne Di Rosario, yes. who is one of the great, names you know mls a legend absolute legend uh in, in that league and and in the sport of soccer and you know he his dalliance in indoor was short but it was memorable but also it was really i think a cool moment that year when the when the masa was able to say that they were tri-national you know and that they had teams in, in all three major north american countries and i just kind of wondered like I know there were some money issues in, in Mississauga on the ownership side, but from the fan side, was was there any cottoning to the sport? Did you feel like there was a chance if in a different situation with different backing? Did you think there was a chance for the Metro Stars? Absolutely, and I'll tell you why. Um, the They were really smart about the way they approached that first season until they got into the season. Um, the year before, they arranged – three i believe it was three home friendlies they created a, a canadian national it was the C canadian arena soccer association which was created they created a canadian national arena team for the very first time and they arranged three friendlies I believe it was three one against mexico one against brazil and i, I believe there's an american game in there as well it might have been on the road though actually they played a couple on the road Two for sure, though. And those games, the Mexico game drew, I'm going to say three at least, at the Hershey Center in Mississauga, which is about 5,500. The Brazil game drew over 4,000 fans. This is, and this is, sorry, I wrote in the, the, the comments beforehand that I'm dog sitting for my brother's dog. Now, there we go. All right, she should be fine. And, uh, <laughs> oh, man, I'll tell you, no. She's been so good up until I get on air. This is the funny part. That's anyway, hilarious. So those she doesn't like the Brazilian team. Oh, yeah, that's what we. That's how, that's what we're figuring, picking up. She's an import from Australia, so I'm not sure what she likes or doesn't like. Like, uh, <laughs> I'd rather just be back from Australia. Um, but anyway, so those games were they had this, uh, youth soccer entire teams in the crowd. They had, I mean, I, I'm been a big part of the Toronto soccer community for years and years. Like in terms, I used to host a, a nationally broadcast show for the Canadian Soccer League. Just seeing all these old, everyone was coming out for these games and the excitement was off the charts. And the first game they ever had against Mexico was was close, was was a really close game. Um, and, uh, and they beat Brazil in the second game with Dero scoring a golden goal. And uh, I mean, Craig, I'll send you the footage at some point if you guys want to throw it up just for future reference. It is amazing. I mean, the, it was packed in there, packed. And I couldn't help but thinking after D-Row scored, I was like, this is going to be a big success, especially because they'd signed D-Row for the next year. And without saying too much about it, I just, it was the weirdest thing though. And then there was a, there was a period after, I think that game was in, early May of, uh, of 18. And I feel like there was next to no marketing that was done um, uh, from, from that point on. I think that might've been a big thing so that so many people were surprised when there was a launch of this local team in the Toronto area. And there are, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but just to give you an idea, everyone thinks that hockey is the number one sport in Canada. Well, it is from a money perspective and stuff, but soccer is by far the biggest sport in terms of participation in the country and has been for well over 20 years. It's, it's not even close. 
there are tons of kids playing soccer, people playing soccer. TFC, of course, draws really well. Um, I just think that it, it, it needs to be marketed a little bit better than what it was. It's unfortunate. But I think that they should, at some point, done properly, another kick at the can, I think it would do very well up there. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the one of the, my favorite things, too, is seeing how uh, this season specifically, MSO has uh, stepped it up in the uh, content and brought in a couple of more shows. And uh, if you, again, to the listeners, if you haven't checked some of these out, MSL Mondays, which usually come out on Tuesdays, <clears throat> um, and then under review <laughs> as well. Uh, no, it's MSL Mondays is usually like late in the afternoon is when you're going to watch it. And then under review, which I absolutely love, uh, yeah. that goes over, you know, some of the, the uh, plays that maybe the refs may or may not have uh, done a good or not good job on. Uh, it's just really good content. Uh, and I'm interested to hear kind of your, um, you know, perspective on it and, and how you feel about content. And uh, are you like me that thinks we need more MSL content out there? Well, it's... Uh... I mean, this year it's been pretty amazing the amount of things they've come out with. I mean, restarting primetime um, after a couple of years, midweek with Michelle, uh, Mondays with the guys, but I think just launched three weeks ago, roughly, or something around there. And then and then the review. Um, I mean, I, I they're definitely going in the in the right direction. I mean, it's I think you'd be hard pressed to find too many leagues not in the not in the you know the major league category in terms of you know baseball and the nhl and stuff like that that has the amount of properties that the that this league has going right now and have launched in one year um because my show was a relaunch and those other three shows were just launched this year and that's pretty phenomenal i think that says a lot to the league and i had keith tozer on the show uh which which is coming out tomorrow and uh, and we chatted about that, and and his main thing was they they were very focused. You know, JP Della Camera, and and himself and Shap were focused on making the MASL part of the conversation of U.S. soccer again, and and really getting that media footprint out there again. And I think they I think they've done a spectacular job in one year. You've got. MESL primetime, yeah, we did it two years ago, but it was a relaunch this year. We've got four new shows in one year, um, which I which I think is certainly a step in the right direction. And and yeah, who knows what they're going to come up with next year? I don't know. I haven't chatted with them about them yet, but they're definitely they're they're doing a lot, and I think it's it's heading in the right direction. All right, before we let you go, I wanted to just kind of look a little bit forward because, and I know you you'll be doing this on the show as you continue through the week. Uh, after you go, we're going to get into this next week. I, I'm calling it moving week, just like, you know, a sure. Saturday at the Masters, right? Moving day. Because th things are going to happen, especially in the West. Things are going to be happening. Uh, big, big points are, are going to drop here. But there's a new format in the MASL this year. And Alex, it's my favorite in 13 years of being around the sport because it's the most democratic it's the most egalitarian it just makes sense you know that the league has a point system the yeah. there's three divisions the three division winners are the top three seeds that makes sense the next five best totals are going to get in and then we're going to go there's no regionalization it's yeah. not okay you know you're going to play the second place team in the west which is what the soccer's knew was their situation just year in and year out you're going to play the second place team in your division then you're yep. going to play the best team in the southwest and that was always the mexican team you know and and that's going to be your path to yeah. to get just to cannibalize the finals. each other yeah in your division yeah you just cannibalize yeah. each other don't you and it's absolutely it's yeah. And it's not really that fair because it, it wound up just being, you know, a, a couple of teams, certain matchups, but now it's one V eight, two V seven, three V six, four V five. And we'll talk about it even more later, but I double checked this with the league, Alex, this week, it's a reseed in the second round. Yep. So it's not a bracket. It's not okay. One eight is going to take on four five. It's the highest seeded remaining team is going to take on the lowest seeded remaining team and then the two right. middle seeds uh right. will, will match up so it really does add even more to the race that right now between san diego and florida is seemingly heading to this march 31st denouement where it's going to be one or the other yeah and there's no there's just no easy passes this year i love it and i love like looking at the matchups for the first round 
um it's it's uh it's 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 crazy some of the stuff that could happen right now i pull, I, I took a snapshot of the uh of the um uh what's it called uh, the the bracket that i did for the show if i can pull it up here just take a quick look at but it's it's um some of those first round matchups are going to be uh are, are going to be crazy and and right now you've got as the way it sits right now the four five you would have baltimore playing chihuahua and if if you're baltimore you do not want i nobody i'm telling my right now for me it's i mean the san diego florida chihuahua but chihuahua is the most frightening team yep to me um out there. like that's tough to say now i san diego i think is is the best team i've seen so far this year i will say that i think they're the they're the they're the best team the florida game on the 31st is going to say is going to be just oh i can't wait for that um that is the, that is like the, the prime time game of the year but Craig, you and I talked about this on the show. Chihuahua starting off 0-7 made absolutely no sense to me. Yeah. Uh, oh, there she is. Hello. This is Nala, everybody. If she comes up behind me here. Yeah. But, um, but but some of the matchups that could that could happen in the first round. I love the points based format. Um they're just it, it's gonna be absolutely fascinating uh to, to watch what, what happens uh in the playoffs. And to me, from from everything I've seen so far this year, uh, top to bottom, the West is the best. I mean, in terms of the strength of the division, um, yeah, Tacoma got smoked last weekend in in Florida, but Tacoma's had a couple of those games. But they've uh, day in day out. I mean, they they could shock anybody. Tacoma, like I mean, they they can pull it out. When you've got Nick Pereira there, you never know what's you know what's going to happen. Um, but this is going to be one of the most fascinating first rounds that we've seen in, in quite some time. Um, and then, as you mentioned, the reseeding after that. So yeah, there's going to be no cruising this year at all. And really quick, um, cause I know you guys got to get back to your stuff. I, I talked to Victor Pereira. I don't know if you guys saw last, last week's show, talked to Victor yeah. and asked him that question about the extra incentive. No, the extra incentive a Brazilian. Um, You're talking about a Brazilian. She does not like Brazilians. She does not like them. We're <laughs> talking about the Brazilians. It's true. This is Nala, everybody, by the way. She <laughs> but asked him that question about the extra motivation. Florida, of course, just were unbelievable in the regular season last year. Far and away the best team in terms of the standings. And then, you know, get knocked out by you guys. Is there actually – didn't even didn't even try to hide it. Nope. Because a lot of times you'll get professional players who are like, no, 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 no. We're just, you know, we don't even look ahead. He was like, yeah, the, you know, we can say the whole one day at a time thing, but no, we've been looking forward to this, you know, for, for some time. It's been extra incentive all season long for them, the fact that they got knocked out in, uh, you know, after such a great season and they entered this season and it was, it was the Newman or nothing. Like they were just full on focused on that. So I cannot wait till the game on the 31st. I know your question was just about the seating. But I had to no, throw that. Good. I had to throw that in the end there. Oh, it's it's going to be. Uh, you guys are. You guys must be just pumped thinking about that as well. Ah, uh, dude, uh, we, we we've pulled out all the stops. We got five dollar GA tickets, free parking, two dollar oh. beers. We're trying to get everyone we possibly can yeah. to oh, come yeah. to this match because it's a Thursday night. It's like it's not ideal. It's not what we yeah. want to have yeah. a weeknight, uh, you know, work weeknight, but we're, we're going to try and make it as big as possible. My friend, listen, yeah. I'm going to let you go. I, I, I really all appreciate right. you spending this time with all the fans. And again, uh, MASL primetime. You, if you haven't subscribed to MASL TV, you're not doing it right. So make sure you get on there and every Wednesday, uh, check it out. And I, I'm sure, uh, now I, I will be accepting your next guest request. Uh, Alex, <laughs> you have to, we'll be to <laughs> do a playoff talk, right? So we'll be doing it. But, uh, guys, thank you so much. Love what you guys do. Uh, San Diego is just such a great organization. And, you know, love the banner behind you there. You know, awesome sense. So, uh, yeah, you guys do a great job. And uh, keep up the great work. And we'll chat later then. Hey, Alex, Appreciate real quick. You, Alex. Just, hey, real quick. Craig, stop. Okay? Because we're <laughs> talking about content and making content. All right? And I feel like. 
Maybe I need to throw my plug in here real quick. Um, it's like one of those things that I got to do. So hold on one sec. All right, here we go. Oh, oh, oh yeah, there we go. Oh, Let's shoot. I need, hold on. Welcome to MSL Primetime with uh, Jerry Jimenez. Uh, Alex Bashabansky couldn't make it in today, so I'm filling in. Uh, Absolutely. What do you think? See, look, this, this studio is amazing. It just looks good. <laughs> It's, uh, I threw a couple of soccer pictures there as well in the background. So, uh, yeah, I love I really that. Like it. Yeah, thanks, boys. It is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a labor of love, and Jerry, you can uh, guest host anytime you want. Let's man. go. <laughs> <laughs> you have to play great for it, though. We'll see how that goes down. But <laughs> yeah, Thank thanks, you so boys. much for coming on, Alex. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate thanks, you, man. Guys. Take care. I just don't know how you got into Alex's closet, Jerry. I mean, you, you I ran, to transport I, yourself. <laughs> gas is really expensive, so I had to virtually do it uh, to make it work. Uh, <laughs> oh, incredible it's a stuff. From San Diego to uh, Toronto is a, it's, it's kind of a long one, so no, it can it's, it's a little bit of a yeah, it's a little bit of a hike. That's uh, there's there's some issues along the way. Our thanks to Alex Bastjevansky. Thank what what a great show! So much fun uh masl prime time i just love having that you know it's one of those things that like usually on a wednesday i just pop it on during lunch you know like yeah. oh heating up that preppies meal that we have at the soccer's office and uh you know settle in check out all the big highlights because i've usually seen all the games but i've i've missed one or two right maybe i've missed a harrisburg versus utica in there somewhere or a st louis dallas or something like that so checking it out and also getting to hear the perspectives of various players from around the league. They do a great job. And I, I'm really appreciative of the content steps. JP Della Camera, you know, Ben Raymond, Lindsay Mogul, what they've done in the MASL front office. It. It's a step in the right direction. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh MASL Mondays is also really good. And like I said, under review is probably um up there as well. It just it's so good to see them talk about those things. And they've talked about the soccer quite a bit on that show. And I don't think they have that many episodes in. <laughs> they've already talked about the soccer, I think, every single time. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's good. And I, I absolutely love M MSL Primetime. Give that a shot. If you haven't already checked it out, YouTube, uh, MASL TV, go and check that out. It's, it's amazing. And, uh, again, you know, a step in the right direction. But I want to throw my hat in there, Craig. You almost cut me out. Yeah. I was like, oh, wait, wait, sorry. wait. wait. I want my yeah, own I image. Forgot, I, almost forgot the, I almost forgot the bit. I, I, you we never gotta, forget the bit. It's very bad planting. production value if I forget we, the bit. We got to start planting small seeds. See, that was a very small seed. I'm, I don't think I was too like forward about it. You yeah. know, so it's just small. Here. Small seed. Don't, don't cut yourself short, Jerry. Is, You're not that small a seed. Talking about we're just gonna do this the entire time and pretend like that. <laughs> this is our studio. Here I am in my giant fluorescent <laughs> studio. <laughs> Here like, I am in my back <laughs> cave. In the back cave. Fire the highlights! Ah! I'd be, <laughs> I'd be like General Zod in there. Ugh! Dude, are like this. Uh, there, we there we go. Wow! There we if are. You, if you're not watching, no, this is an. I, I, we're gonna get. We're totally gonna get flagged by YouTube, aren't we? Okay, never mind. Forget yeah, it. Yeah, we, we don't want to do that. No. All right, let's talk about some MASL news because I've called it moving week for a reason. And in particular in the MASL West, Jerry, this is the most important week of the Ontario Fury season. There's just no question about it. Ontario will either reinsert themselves into the discussion as a potential stand, uh, uh, Ron Newman Cup contender. They're definitely not going to win the Stanley Cup. Uh, they're either going to reinsert themselves or they're going to be in the conversation to be fighting to make the playoffs. To make the playoffs Jeez. as a result of this week's games. And it starts tomorrow night with the one game that actually matters to the soccers. And the game that you might, you might, if you're a soccers fan, choose to root for the Ontario Fury, if you can find it within yourself to do so. And I know that's like asking a Dodger fan to root for the Giants to win a game. And you're like, what? No. <laughs> or uh, back in the day when we talked about football, a Chargers fan rooting for a Raider team to win a game. You say, well, what? Uh, uh, an LAFC fan rooting for a Galaxy result, right? Like these are things no, that we expect. 
That's not that bad. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> May not be that bad. But Ontario could really reverse their season if they beat Florida tomorrow night at Toyota Arena. And if they were to beat Florida, that would finally actually put the Sockers alone in first place and give them a tiny, tiny bit of a cushion. Because right now, Florida still has the ability to have one more point at the end of the year than the San Diego Sockers. So you really would like to see Florida get a loss along here just to allow us not to have to hit the gas pedal all the way to the finish line to, to try and get first place. Fury could do the Sockers a huge favor, but either way, it should be a great game. Florida's coming East just for one game. And in the middle of the week at that super, super weird, but that's a highlight game. I mean, put it in the middle of the week. It's up against survivor. But other than that, it's definitely the thing to watch on Wednesday night. Go. <laughs> that's how I listening. wonder if the doctor will be giving us the news. That's what Let's I want. To know. Will the doctor be giving us the news? A lot of it. Or will it be sad news that the patient is dying? It's no, inoperable. I, I, I'm. I, I'll be. I'll be honest. I'll be. I'll be rooting for Ontario. I think. I think Ontario can beat Florida. Let's see. Let's find out. Okay. I'd like to see it. I mean, this is one of these things where you can make a lot better head-to-head -head comparison of the tropics. Because mm -hmm. watching the tropics play Baltimore, watching the tropics play Milwaukee, which I have watched them play. I mean, I watched the tropics barely beat Milwaukee, the team that the soccer's rolled off the floor 13 to two, you know, and, but I also just watched them boat race Tacoma last weekend. There's no question that the tropics have a tremendous varied attack. And that trade that we talked about several weeks ago here in this segment on Soccer's Overtime, Jerry, that trade with UCFC where they got Ricardo Diegas and mm -hmm. Junior Allen Carr and was able to act. I mean, Diegas was the best player in that trade by six miles. And he just had a four point game last weekend, a goal and three assists. He's in the middle of their attack. Like he is right in the center of their attack, kind of occupying the role that Ian Bennett did last year because all the other supporting pieces, Pereiras, the MVP candidate, you know, Montalaris, Carvalho, it just go around the, the, the ring there. Almost everybody on the, the Florida team can score. And Diegas really took it, I think, to a next level. So it'll be really interesting to go, okay, take those guys, now put them against some guys we know, put them against Birdo and Johnny and Uzi, you know, the, the defenders that we know where their level is and see how Florida handles it and whether it's a close game or it's a not close game. Uh, and that at least is a little bit of a measuring stick that the soccers can use. And it's some film that the soccers can use. Well, friendly reminder, Craig, also the only two teams, the only reason why we are not uh, at a perfect, you know, perfect record this season is Chihuahua. And it's Ontario handing us that one loss uh, during regulation time. So, you know, is it possible for Ontario to beat Florida? Absolutely. So it's a, well, they've it's done it, right? They did it to, at the beginning oh. of the year. And, and, there, so and there's, on, that. there's yeah, that. Ontario's the only team in the league that's that's defeated the Soccers and the Tropics. The tropics yeah, this year, right. but that was in the first six games of the season, and. Let's be honest now, a little bit of real talk. Uh, we'll we'll do striking fury for 60 seconds. The fury aren't what they were at the start of the year. They're not playing at that level right now. Their level has dropped. Uh, it, it's been a little bit of a rough watch. And they were able to pull out a, a recent game, right? But it's just not, you haven't seen that flow. You haven't seen that. Stinson hasn't been quite as involved as you've seen yeah. in the past. And I, I really, really think that, you know, they never talk about it, but Charlie Gonzalez was the most important player in the Fury attack. He was the guy that could connect Stinson and Taiyu. And of course, they've never had Mike on Diabreu. So Diabreu's never been there. And it used to be there were four guys you had to really account for in the Ontario attack. And then it dropped down to two. And so as a result, I mean, you know, Frank's got his points, he's got his goals, he's got his assists, but 
you know, they lost seven to two to Tacoma, you know, when Tacoma had the chance to be rested and at full strength. Uh, it, they've had these kind of like bafflingly poor performances and, and their last home game was nothing to shake a stick at. So, you know, the Fury need a result, okay? Because now we continue on with moving week. And this weekend involves two two-match series that are going to be critical to the four teams involved. And we'll just stay with our West because Ontario goes to Chihuahua this weekend. Ooh-wee. So it's they play the Tropics Wednesday night. Thursday, they need to make the trip. They need to travel from Ontario down to Tijuana to fly from Tijuana to Chihuahua because you're not going to get to Chihuahua from Ontario. You might be able to get there from LAX, maybe. Uh, but probably that's how they're doing it. And then they're going to play Friday night at Corner Sport Arena, and they're going to play Saturday night at Corner Sport Arena, back to back against the Savage. And so, so game it out here, Jerry. Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Yes. Oh man, Ontario has a tough time coming into. Oh, I'm so oh, excited yeah. to see these games. That's and by the way, play. it's Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Monday. Because oh, they will no. they will fly home Sunday and they host Tacoma Monday. Oh my gosh. Okay, I thought our <laughs> schedule was bad. That's tough. Yeah, well, you know what? I'm gonna be rooting for Ontario against Florida, especially after that. I mean, out of those four games, I think they I think I think two out of four. I think three out of four for Ontario would be f- absolutely fantastic. If yeah. they can't take two out of the four, I think that that's still pretty good. If Ontario beat Florida, took one result out of Mexico, and then come home and take care of business against Tacoma, they're going to be firmly in that four or five spot. Yeah. And, and I think yeah. it's going to be hard to dig them out of that four or five spot. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> wow. But game it out the other way. All right. If the Fury lose tomorrow to the tropics and then go down to Chihuahua and suffer the fate that the last three teams that have gone into Chihuahua have suffered where they lose back-to-back games and they get blown out and obliterated in both games. They will come to that Monday game, Jerry. And those three points I'll tell you right now will be for their season. It'll be for their season. If they don't win that, Tacoma game. The rest of their games, the rest of the year, are against Florida, Chihuahua, and us. <laughs> and, oh, wow. and, and they don't want to go to the last game of the season needing to beat us at Pachanga Arena to make the playoffs. Like, because we'll beat them just for the laugh. You know, like, it, it's it's an interesting situation. They thought they were championship bound. Ontario is is third place right now. It, you know, remember when they said that the Sockers were going to be in third place? It's it's Ontario in third place. The Sockers have already won the division with five matches to go. And really, the Fury, they can either put themselves back in the conversation or they can take themselves all the way out of it this weekend. You know, Ontario is a, such a fun team to, to watch when they're not playing the Sockers. So I'm really looking forward to these four games. I think it's going to be very fun to watch. They know they have to bring it, clearly. So, uh, yeah, no, and, you know, it's it's like that MSL is going to MSL, man. I mean, I think I saw somebody here. No no crying, you know, cry me a river. I think it's the same thing for us, you know, happened in the last two games. Um, you know, it, it's MSL is going to MSL, and sometimes it's life is unfair. And so here we go. Now you have to show your best team, bring it to Chihuahua for two games back to back, and then come home and, and take care of business there as well. So we'll, we'll see. Now, we said that's one of two gigantic back-to-back series. The other one is going to be a home-and-home back-to-back, which is Milwaukee and St. Louis. And St. Louis will host Milwaukee on Friday night, and then they'll switch venues, and it'll be Milwaukee hosting St. Louis on Saturday. And again, if you look at those standings right now, it is St. Louis 8, and it is Milwaukee 9. Milwaukee needs six points, plain and simple. Milwaukee needs to win both matches, take six points. That would be enough. They would flip-flop. They would leapfrog St. Louis. They would move into the eighth position. 
uh, and potentially be a first round opponent uh, for the San Diego Sockers. The wave said in their post-match release that they are expecting some players back. I would hope that that means Marcio because Marcio Leite has been out and I think they've won once since if that. So, you know, yeah. Marcio left and their team totally fell apart. Uh, if they get him back, obviously they, they, they raise up a level, but St. Louis could all but clinch. They won't clinch, but they could all but clinch a playoff spot by winning these two games against Milwaukee. The last three games for St. Louis after they finish this weekend set are all against Kansas City. And two of them are at Cable Dahmer Arena where they'll probably lose. But if they win these two games against Milwaukee and they can handle Kansas City at home, which they have done already this year, I think St. Louis makes the playoffs uh, as that eighth seed. Otherwise, Milwaukee's got a chance. That's going to be an interesting two games as well. Yeah. Who are you rooting for on this one? I mean, we don't really have a horse in the race, but. Underdog? You know, I mean. Oh, Milwaukee? I, I'm just I, kidding. I, I, yeah. You know, if, if I'm just really being cynical and only thinking about the soccer's. You know, Milwaukee has Ian Bennett and they potentially can have Marcio Leite. And, and those are two championship players. You know, and I don't think St. Louis has any championship level players on their team. I think Muhammad Ndi is a really, really good player uh, who's carried them offensively. Uh, St. Louis has a very poor defense. And I think they'd be an outstanding matchup if the Sockers were playing them in the first round. Uh, I feel like that would be a, yeah. a, a nice, a, a, a nice setup. Uh, for San Diego. I feel like the Sockers would be a favorite against either team, uh, you know, regardless of who comes out. So I don't have a strong lean uh, on this. I don't think that Sockers fans need to have a strong preference one way or the other. So I just, I, I narrow it down to Ian Bennett, Marcio Leite. I know those guys, those guys could rise up, have gigantic games. So therefore, I guess I'm rooting for St. Louis. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Hey, whoever it is, bring them. We got, Craig Charles's mustache will take on yep. anybody. <laughs> uh, a couple other games of note, Baltimore at Florida uh, on Sunday. So the tropics have this weird week where they fly out to the West coast. They're here tonight. Uh, you know, they're up uh, at the Ayers hotel in Ontario, probably, you know, they play tomorrow, they fly back to Florida and then Sunday they play the blast. It's just kind of a weird uh, week for them. But Baltimore, as we mentioned, hasn't beaten a team that's good yet this year. So here's an opportunity again, and the Sockers would be very happy if Baltimore took that opportunity uh, and beat Florida at home, Dallas at Kansas city. Dallas is one of those teams that Sockers fans at least have to kind of keep just the corner of your eye on the sidekicks because right now they're not in our range. But if Dallas took a little bit of a tumble in the standings, if Ontario wins those games, if St. Louis wins those games uh, that we talked about, then a Dallas loss and all of a sudden Dallas is starting to fall down into that seven, eight range where they could be a first round opponent for the soccer's. It's going to be interesting. So yeah, now, now I'm starting to see why you call a moving week. I get it. Everyone's going to be moving. The standings will be much more settled after Sunday night. And, and you know, the soccer's result against Tacoma, to be honest, other than San Diego pushing for number one is superfluous. To, to everything else, you know, but we'll be watching. The, <laughs> I'm going to be watching love, a lot I of MSL. Love being in this position, Craig. This is awesome. I love it. It's what you want. It's what yep. you want. Yes. Sir. Uh, okay. Some quick soccer's news uh, before we get out. I thought it might be fun, and and uh, I, I threw it in the in the menu, so you've at least seen it uh, to think about MVP. Because it's, <laughs> I, I feel like it's almost inevitable that like Ian Bennett's going to win MVP this year for scoring. He'll wind up with 40 something goals for a team that may or may not make the playoffs, you know, and if they make the playoffs, they're going to make the playoffs as an eight seed. And this league has a really bad habit of awarding the MVP to the high scoring player on a third place team. Like, it's just, it's a bad habit. 
<laughs> it's a bad habit that this league has of guys just pulling open the leaders tab on MASLsoccer.com and seeing what guys are, you know, images are in the circles and going, okay, well, those must be the players. And that's not a knock on Ian Bennett. It's a philosophical discussion of what's most valuable. What's more valuable, being the leading scorer on a 500 team or a losing team or being the most integral part of a winning team? Because I would argue the latter. You know, for me, uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of need a little bit of transparency. Like, does somebody just go in and pick? Is it people that get to vote just in the front office? How, do, how does that end up happening? How does, you know, that work? There are votes. Players get to vote. Staff gets to vote. Okay. Um, I, I I get a ballot, you know, for all the awards. Um, okay. I think as a broadcaster or front office member, I don't know which one it is that I get it for. I think it's as a broadcaster. Um, who knows? You might get a ballot now as a podcaster, Jerry. We'll try I'll and take figure it. that out. Try, try and figure that out. Uh, and, and listen, I like what uh, S Barber 55 says, who cares about MVP when you win the cup? I mean, yes, right. Yeah. Of course, of course, of course. We love that Ontario is, you know, hashtag awards bound or hashtag weekly awards bound, you know, like player of the week bound. <laughs> and he just said Clayson DeLima for MVP. I mean, right. That's At this point, you sound just mean, dude. That's, right. that's a true that's a troll comment but it's an expert one <laughs> uh expert troll level troll level 10 of 10 um you to the show sorry you're gonna have to go watch all the episodes <laughs> this season to understand what we talk about okay so I, let's just talk about our team right now on soccer's overtime if you were gonna rank our top three mvp candidates on this year's soccer's team what would be your one two three Oh man! See, so I actually never read the notes. Um, true story. Uh, no, <laughs> I've been thinking about this, and it's so hard because what do you take into consideration? What do you uh, do? You look at points overall. Do you look at assists? Also, do you take in goals? I think. Oh man. Um, also, with kind of being in the background and, and knowing how much of an effect some of these players have had on the team in general, I'm going to go with these three. And it's very hard, okay? And it's probably, it's, there's like, there's like four other players that can go in my, to my top three. But for me, it has to be one, two, three. It has to be Craig Childs, Tavoy Morgan, and Leonardo de Oliver. Okay. I, okay. So why is Childs one for you? Uh well one he has twenty two goals, I think right? so yeah yeah he has like 15, 15 to twenty assists seventeen assists something like that I think seventeen and he also is just the greatest captain ever uh okay yeah, yeah I feel that <laughs> but, I feel that I feel like he honestly has made such a such a difference this season on this team that if you remove Craig Childs from this team, it is not at all the same team, even though he might not contribute the way you uh, would look at like a Tavoy Morgan, you know, like in numbers, he, I think he does so much more. And, and for the spirit of the team, for bringing the team together and then adding as much as he has already. I mean, come on, man. Like I, I feel like Craig Childs is up there. But I can also make the same argument for Tavoy Morgan, which is why I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's tough. It's, it's a incredibly tough. tough. It's incredibly tough. I think there's Good six problem, uh, extremely worthy guys that you can discuss. So I'm I'm leaving off three when I do this myself. It's a dangerous exercise. And I understand that completely. Uh, and I think some of the guys I'm leaving off would be first team all MASL. Dude, example, I put Aero Pino in there now that I... Mm, yeah, like, and neither one of us mentioned Churras. And Churras... So, yeah, it's... Okay, I think Churras is first team all MASL. I think Pino was defender of the year. I think Pardo was goalkeeper of the... I, I know Pardo was goalkeeper of the year. Yeah. Uh, and, and those are good things to have, but they all deserve to be discussed in MVP as well. All right, so I'll go in reverse order. Third for me is Tavoy Morgan, because Tavoy Morgan is uh exemplifying what it means to be a target forward 
He is a player that other teams are relentlessly double teaming. And on our club, to have a player that is being relentlessly double teamed, it's like giving everyone else a hall pass to be able to be creative and succeed. And with that, Tavoy has 29 goals. You know, he's about to get to 30 goals. Uh, you know, he he doesn't always get assists, but he had a four assist game where he showed that he can distribute. But most often what he's doing is getting what I would call the hockey assist, where he's passing out of a double team that leads to a player being able to make a 1v1 move, take on a, a defender, lay the ball off, and that's where the shot becomes a goal. And so Morgan doesn't get a point for that, but really he created the goal. Much like, uh, for example, he had a goalless game against Chihuahua, but he drew a penalty and then he held a defender within the crease that allowed a cross pass to get to Childs to, you know, to allow Leo to, to pass to Childs for a goal. So uh, I would go to Voy third. I think he's just done an absolutely outstanding job. Second for me would be Boris. And you could really make a strong argument for first for Boris as well. Um, yep. Because he anchors the defense and he's the one guy, he's literally the one guy in this team. You can't lose. I think the, the number one guy I'm going to, I'm going to list, you can't lose either, but if you lost Boris, where would you be? You know, you'd probably be Xavier and then looking for another goalkeeper. And, and that's a difficult spot. So you you need to, have, Boris has been the rock of this defense. He organizes everything. He's a leader. He's an emotional leader. He is a calming influence at times. He's an enraging influence at times when it needs to be that direction. You know, and I think he's one of the very most important players on the club. But the guy that I would promote for soccer's and for league MVP is Leonardo de Oliveira. And I just feel like he, and I talked about it earlier, right? That was my tease. Like he handles the game at the game's most important points all the time. He's that guy that wins the ball in a do or die from the other team's best player that gets out of a double team and gets the pass that leads. And who in the league is better at taking on a defender and then getting the ball off to, to set up a slam dunk, you know, or three, yeah. or three. Right. Defenders. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and, you know, Leo has 11 goals. Leo is the king of missing by an inch the net, you know, it's like, and he, you know, if he had to, he could get three or four goals. You know, if he had to be at the end of these passes instead of the back of them, he could get three or four goals, but he's found this spot already a career high. 27 assists. He's going to wind up with 30 plus assists this season. Who knows if he has another huge game, he could get 35 to 40, you know, assists in a season. And, and, and that's almost back to old MISL levels in terms of, of setting up teammates. But it's that Leo's a midfielder. Leo runs more than anyone. He has to track back, and he does. He's blocking shots. He's he's almost to double digits, I think, in blocked shots now, you know, in, in addition to everything else he's doing. And I feel like he handles all of these critical moments, and he does it with not just success, but with panache and with flair and with this incredible watchability and likability and you know, it, it's built off his MVP performance in the Ron Newman Cup finals last year. And I think he's getting no dap to around the league. He's, he hasn't won a single weekly award. He hasn't won a single monthly award. He hasn't been in the conversation. Nobody's talking about him. That's fine. You know, the league can make him all league honorable mention if they want. You know, <laughs> that'll be fine. But we know. And as far as I'm concerned on my power rankings, he's number one on my list. Yeah, no, you make a good, uh, make very good points about all those guys. Cause yeah, you're right. Boris and, and Leo, maybe, um, yeah, Boris is definitely in the conversation. You know, it's just very tough. It's a tough place to be, but also a very good, uh, problem to have, right? As a soccer supporter, that the one, two, and three are not that easy, uh, to pinpoint. And that's amazing. Uh, I, I love it. And, uh, yeah, we'll see where it ends up. Cause there's still five games to play, Craig. Still five games to play. Uh, we real quick, 
We're waiting on the league uh, to allow us to put out a playoff press release announcing that our playoff home game will be on April 10th. Uh, we we know that's the case. Uh, they balked at us putting it out uh, because they're trying to lock down basically every team's arena availability. And there might be one team that could possibly play the soccers that could possibly screw things up in terms of they don't have a match availability before our game. Uh, but I don't, that's, that's behind the curtain stuff. Don't worry about it. What we're hoping to be able to say is that we're going to release playoff tickets for sale to the public, uh, starting Sunday night at our match and continuing online Monday morning and season ticket holders are going to get an advanced chance to buy the entire playoff strip and secure all their seats before single game people get the chance to start vulturing and, and, and picking off their tickets. So uh, regardless of when the league ma- lets us make the announcement, season ticket holders will get a chance before the general public. So be ready for that. I thought I was going to release that today. We didn't get the go ahead yet, but hopefully tomorrow. Uh, su- Sunday is military night. Uh, Soccer's will be wearing the digital blue camouflage uniform uh, that is over my shoulder. If you are watching, uh, you will be getting oh, a camouflage bucket hat. Uh, you know, make sure you get there. Uh, don't be there right at kickoff because you want to make sure that you get one of those hats. Uh, but I believe we have a thousand or fifteen hundred uh, hats available to give away. Beautiful hat presented by Front Wave Credit Union, Soccer's, and the Tacoma Stars. There's the hat. If you're watching, uh, you can. It's sturdy. It's good. Perfect for the summer for you. Things get hot. Go fishing. Whatever. Go to a ball game. Uh, you know, your soccer's hat can uh, take you along the way and keep your head uh, properly, you know, cancer free. And the soccer's go for win 16 in a row, taking on Tacoma. Uh, uh, you know, Jerry, there's not much to say about the game. I think San Diego will probably not have Craig Childs. They will probably not have Felipe Gonzalez. Uh, they'll definitely not have Guerrero Pino. Uh, you know, the club wants to have all those guys for the East Coast road trip, uh, you know, the following week. I think you can beat Tacoma without those guys. But as Alex Bastiavansky said earlier, the stars always have that ability to rise up and play a good game. And it just depends on whether good Danny shows up. You know, he's only kind of showing up one out of four this year instead of every other game or three out of four games. He's he's showing up one out of four. But usually that one out of four is against San Diego. It just it always seems to be that way. Craig, you think after this uh, big, long break that we've had, you think maybe it's... It's a trap. No, it's Maybe. always a trap. It, it could be a trap. It, it, you know, you think about this, man. The soccer's have won 15 in a row. Every game we play from now on out is a trap. And, and whenever, if we ever lose, you you know what? The, it's, that minute, MASL off the wall is going to be like, yeah, I told you so. They aren't that great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, homie with his power rankings will drop us to fourth and move the team that beat us up to number one. Like <laughs> the all this, it's just it's a guarantee. Everyone party is in the box, dying I mean, to beat the soccer. Right party in the box. Party C ratings. The box, we lose. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Corn dogs for everybody. Extra crispy. <laughs> like everyone's going to be passing the corn dogs. If and when the soccer, if the soccer's lose to Florida, oh, Florida's the favorite. Florida's the favorite. Even though San Diego would have won, you know, eighteen in a row going into that match. Ah, favorite. Never mind. You know, so it's cool though. That's life is the front runner. I know it. It's just like when you're the chip leader in a poker tournament. Everyone wants to see you lose. They don't yeah. want to see you succeed and get more chips. They want you to lose and fail. And that's fine. It's part of the price of being number one. You know what, you know, man? I, I like it up here. I like it up here. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's a good place to be. So, uh, you know, soccer's just need to take care of business on Sunday. That's all there is to it. I'll just leave it to that. Uh, and we continue to work on an opening night. I'm working on our ceremonial first kick uh, for an opening night. I'm working on maybe having a wiffle ball celebration uh, at, at an opening night. And what? Uh, at, at halftime. Yeah, a little wiffle ball uh, exhibition uh, from the floor. But don't forget, if you haven't taken advantage of this yet, it's the best game of the year, Soccer's in Tropics, to decide who's number one in the league in the playoff table unless Florida kicks a couple games between here and there. That's what this game's going to be all about. So we are opening things up. $5 GA tickets, free parking, one night only. 
$2 Bud Lights. If you show up in Padres gear, pick up a Soccer's Championship pint glass while supplies last. If you show up specifically wearing a Tatis jersey, we have instructed the soccer squad to offer you a hug. You do not have to take it, but you will be offered a hug. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just because it's it's kind of a sad <laughs> time right now uh, if you're a Tatis fan. Uh, and we will be giving folks with with baseball gear on to a BOGO coupon for a GA ticket for uh, a soccer's playoff match. So it's, it's going to be a really, really fun night. Uh, Thursday, March 31st, opening night. Of course, the following Sunday, Fan Appreciation Night against Ontario and the final game of the regular season. Oh, if you have a cast on your wrist, then you might be the Padres shortstop. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, not, not, no. That would be amazing, but no. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, they're not going to make Fernando available to us for, for an opening night. You're crazy, John. You know what? That, that's that's like saying like Landon Donovan would play for the soccer. That's what that's like. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait what wait a minute <laughs> wait, I'm, not giving hope. Okay, I'm, just joking. I'm just joking it's yeah. not gonna... <laughs> it won't be to tease no. it won't be to tease we're gonna wait till we sign him to to be on the team yes there you go <laughs> his age 37 season once this 14 year contract's up we're waiting <laughs> <laughs> we've got the contract waiting <laughs> The, the the new league uh you know they just put in a new uh you know player in or like designated hitter now he, he's gonna be the uh dwb which is the designated water boy for yeah. the stalkers yeah once he once he's up we're gonna instant we're gonna install a velodrome so he can just you know <laughs> ride a motorcycle around around as fast as he oh, can stop. and whip out oh oh he, he swore against it that's right that's good. Yeah. All right. That brings an end to this week's Soccer's <laughs> Overtime. <laughs> like a lead balloon, we come to an end <sighs> of this week's Soccer's Overtime. But what a fun uh, series and what a, what a fun show uh, it was. It was fun to beast the East, to take care of Baltimore, to clinch the West. We, I, I, you know, buried the lead, Jerry, 93 minutes. And we won the West Division. It's over. It's not like we were expecting not to. It's not like someone picked us to finish third. I mean, do we even need to do this podcast anymore? We were fine. I'm just kidding. We'll be here. All the way to the championship, my friend. All the way. All the way to the championship. We will be back next week with episode 20. Uh, Of course, we'll be with you Sunday, 5.05 p.m. from Pachanga Arena for the Soccers and the Tacoma Stars. Come on out. Get your bucket hat, courtesy of Front Wave Credit Union, and join us. If you can't make it, You know, uh, we will have the call for you, Nate Abrea and I on masl tv jerry how can folks follow you let you know uh, let everyone know how to follow cheeto fc and what's going on yeah go check me out on at cheeto fc also i'm on twitter at cheeto jerry and uh i'm just working on some stuff right now so go and check it out and uh go soccer's and you can follow me at 619 Sports on Twitter at 619 Sports and Life on Instagram. Special thanks to Alex Bastrovansky from MASL Primetime, today's special guest. For Jerry Jimenez, I'm Craig Elston. Until we talk to you next Tuesday at 5 right here on Twitch. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Sunday at the arena. And go Sockers!